Okay, our first panelist is Peter Coyote. Uh, he has performed as an actor for some of the world's most distinguished filmmakers, including Barry Levinson, Roman Polanski, Pedro Almodovar, I'm not sure I said that right, Steven Spielberg, Walter Hill, Martin Ritz, Steven Soderbergh, Diane Curse, Sidney Pollack, and Jean-Paul Rapineau. He is an Emmy award-winning narrator of over 120 documentary films, including Ken Burns, National Parks, Prohibition, the West, and the upcoming Dust Bowl. Mr. Coyote has written a memoir of the 1960s counterculture, a wonderful book called Sleeping Where I Fall, which received universally excellent reviews, appeared on three bestseller lists, sold five printings in hardback, and was re-released with a new cover in May 2009. A chapter from that book, book uh, Carla's Story, won a Pushcart Prize. He's currently working on a new book about politics. From 1975 to 1983, he was a member of the literature panel of the National Endowment of the Arts and then chairman of the California State's State Arts Council. During his chairmanship and tenure, expenditures on the arts rose from one to $16 million annually. So thank you for that, Peter. He is an ordained Buddhist who has been practicing for 36 years and was ordained as a priest, I believe. That's right, in 2011, is that correct? He is and has been engaged in political and social causes since his early teens. So Peter will begin by telling you uh, something about the Diggers, I think, and the, his, his own experience with the influence of the Beats. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear all right? When you saw that New Year's Eve <clears throat> celebration, and they said it was 1941, that was the year I was born. Oh, they said 49. Well, I'm so old that I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> it actually makes more sense, because by the time I was 14, I had gotten my first inkling of the counterculture through folk music, and that led me off the suburbs and off the asphalt and into the province of poets and revolutionaries and anarchists and communists. And of course I ran into poets. And when was, when was On the Road published? 57. 57, yeah. So in 57 I could drive. And I remember the original black cover had a uh, kind of a, a surreal modernist uh, outline of a city on it. And when you saw someone carrying that book, it was kind of a talismanic calling card, that this person was hungry for some kind of experience and some kind of authenticity like you were. And so I grew up in the kind of Truman, Eisenhower years, in a kind of reality based on science and modernism and logic and rationality. By the time that I was 16, that had worn quite thin. And um, by the time I was 17, I was in jail in Mexico. I got caught with eight kilos of weed, a copy of On the Road, and uh, doing my best to kind of understand what this pursuit of freedom and authenticity was about. And then, as luck would have it, slightly later in life, I came to California and I was befriended and became intimate friends with people like Michael McClure and Lou Welch and Gary Snyder, and through him, Allen Ginsberg, and a number of these people who had been my mentors in college, just reading Donald Allen's book, New American Poetry, 1945-60. to 60. So these people were like my forebears, as the American transcendentalists were for them. They opened up a psychic terrain, they opened up possibilities outside the cultural paradigms, and through their example, challenged me to follow it. The Diggers were an anarchistic group in the Haight-Ashbury that kind of pushed countercultural ideas to the very edges. We were cultural revolutionaries. We couldn't imagine people throwing themselves on the barricades to be classified lumpen proletariat. So we challenged ourselves and other people to imagine a world that they wanted to live in and to make it real by doing it. So we wanted to live in a world with free food. So we figured out how to feed 600 people a day for nothing. We wanted to live without being employees. It seemed like a short circuit <clears throat> to give away your time so that you could earn money to become a consumer when the stuff was out there, if you didn't care if it was new or not. 
So we created a free store in which you could get televisions or furniture or bicycles or tools or clothing for nothing and work for yourself. And we did that for a number of years and then the diggers gradually merged with some other groups and became known as the Free Family. That became several hundred people and we were we established communes to create alternative <coughs> economies and to learn something about the native lore and wisdom of living in place in Northern California and the Southwest. And so all of that was a direct uh, result of being inoculated by the pursuit of freedom <coughs> and authenticity of the beats. And we were lucky enough to have living examples. Gary Snyder was alive, Allen Ginsberg was alive, Michael McClure was alive, David Meltzer was alive, Philip Whalen was alive. And I knew these people intimately, and little by little, my ideas, my romances, my um, <coughs> illusions about them were replaced by images that were far more substantial, far more durable, and actually more admirable. And the, in closing, the last thing I'll say is, the thing that I liked most about this movie was that it has a very impenetrable moral core, an inflexible moral core. It's what the plot spins on. I won't, I won't give it away for you. But the difference between uh, Dean Moriarty and Sal Paradise is basically an ethical difference. And Dylan once had a line in, uh, in a song, I forget the name, oh yeah, it's like a Rolling Stone, where he says, you used to ride on the chrome horse with your diplomat who carried on his shoulders a Siamese cat. And ain't it hard when you discover that he really wasn't where it's at after he took from you everything he could steal. Well, very often, a young writer like, like Sal finds himself without his voice, without having all his powers in order, and falls under the sway of a charismatic person who kind of perfectly embodies the zeitgeist. And this exploration, this film that Walter's made, is not exactly the book, for my money. It's more an exploration of this dynamic of a young artist coming to the fulfillment of his or her powers and separating the chicken shit from the chicken salad. <laughs> so I'm here to give homage to my forebears and to urge you all to go and see and enjoy this film. Thank you.